Hi there everybody and welcome to this episode of Vulcan Knowledge. I'm joined today by Dr. Janine Krippner, all the way from New Zealand. How are you doing, Janine? Really well. Good morning to your good evening over there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> good. Yes. Yeah, so Janine is going to talk to us today about a whole range of things but before we get into some of those it'd be great to know um just something about your your journey and how you've got to where you are today so you're a, vulc- a volcanologist but you've done a whole range of things across science communication science outreach so it'd just be really great to hear some of um, your story yeah i'm from a relatively small town Tewamutu in new zealand um i grew up not knowing any scientists the closest was the meteorologist on the television and of course medical uh, experts at the local center uh, so i was in love with volcanoes we have a bunch of volcanoes in new zealand but i didn't know that that was an option i didn't know that there was that volcanologists existed uh, i didn't know anyone that went to university. So this was a whole world I wasn't even aware of. And when I was 13, um, my geography teacher wrote volcanologist on the board and explained what that was. And I sat back in my chair and thought, that's what I am. And that was it. And <laughs> many years later, uh, I'm actually doing it. And so it's it's been a wild journey of not knowing what I'm doing and figuring out everything along the way. And uh, driven by my passion for volcanoes, and my passion for helping people. So that's taken me some really interesting places. Brilliant, and so whereabouts um, are are you working at the moment and working in between? Uh, Right now, I'm working from home, like so many people around the world, back in my hometown. (laughs) Uh, I moved home last year to be with family because of the pandemic, and I'm still working remotely with the Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program. So I was in Washington DC with them, and still working with them, but in a very different time zone. So I'm very lucky that I can still do that. Yes. <laughs> so what sort of, um, the, the Global Volcanism Program is such a, an imp- important source and database that has been developed over, over the, the past, I can't remember how many, how many years, but um, I don't know if you're able just to tell us a bit more about the Global Volcanism Program and what it's hoping to achieve through its compilation of global volcano data basically yeah so it's been going on for oh goodness i can't remember the how many years or decades but it started out with people sending telegrams of volcanic activity around the world Um, and now it's uh, basically run and managed by ed vensky he uh, has a small team of us who track volcano activity or non-activity through time. We write activity reports that are available for everyone using all of the official information, using satellite data, using uh, things we see on social media to help us have a consistent timeline of volcanic activity around the world. Um, So it's really the only place that does that. And it's really service driven. Everyone is really For us, it's important that this is something that anyone can use. Someone who wants to check out a volcano, if it's in the news, uh, someone who wants to learn about volcanoes, like kids or anyone, and also of scientific value too. Like I used uh, the website, which is where the the database is um, projected all through my PhD. It was so, so helpful. So it's something that I've always thought was just so cool. And now I actually get to do it. So I'm yes. really lucky. Fantastic. As you say, it's got such a great ability to um, attract people from all ends, from the public side to the site the scientists well I know when I need to find out information about a volcano that I'm not necessarily familiar with it's my first go-to place and yeah. so for anyone interested if you see a new volcano on the news um, or you hear about a new eruption then you can just go straight to the Smithsonian uh, if you just type in Smithsonian GVP or global volcanism program it will appear straight there and you can search through any volcano you have questions on and uh, as you said Janine there's a ton of educational resources there as well so if you don't have to be a scientist to um to reap the benefits of this database yeah it's it's really for everyone and that's what we're driven by is being something that's useful and up to date and we are a big part of my job now is is updating a lot of the information we have because when information was put in 20 years ago We've had a lot of scientific advances since then. A lot more research has been done on volcanoes around the world. And we have 
couple thousand volcanoes in there, so it's a big job. <laughs> and we're a small team, so it's um, I'm very fortunate to be part of it. Uh, uh, what sort of um, data sets are those more more recent uh, advances then that we're able to update at this point? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a really awesome question. So uh, we actually have a page dedicated to sort of the question that Ed's put together of is volcano volcanic activity increasing um, and that's something that pro crops up every now and again of volcanoes are more active the ring of fire is going to kill us all like all of that kind of fun stuff um, but we have things like the internet and satellites now so using satellites plus social media like something happens anywhere near people people are tweeting about it or it's it's on facebook um, and then that hits global media so we can actually see almost basically everything except for the submarine stuff <laughs> anything on land we see it so um, we go through time as geologists so that's my background as a physical volcanologist is looking at the rocks to understand what's happened in the past we can see um, the eruptive activity uh, there is some that is eroded away especially if it's in glaciated areas um, previously, but we can track that through time and see at least the larger volcanoes. So we know that based on the information we have, this is pretty normal to have 40 to 50 ongoing eruptions at any given time. That doesn't mean the volcano is erupting on a given day, but mm. an eruptive period can have quiet days and more active days, right? So we track all of that. Um, so we use images as a really important tool because through images, we can show people, this is what this looks like, this is what you're seeing. So when people are empowered with information, if they see something that is awe-inspiring or scary in the media, they can go, okay, this is what I'm looking at. So it's really about empowering people with information everywhere. Yeah, wow, and as you said, well, a picture says a thousand words, if not more. <laughs> yeah. So, and I think that's a really nice segue into um, Thinking about the use of social media uh, when it comes to volcanoes, as you say, the moment an event happens, where do you go to your first source of information? You start looking for tweets because that is immediately what people will do in the case of any geohazard, whether it's a volcanic eruption, particularly in the events of like an earthquake. If I get a buzz notification on my phone that an earthquake has just appeared somewhere, the first place I will go to is Twitter to look yeah. for the information and to see well, the, the impact, and it's not just people tweeting about the impacts that's happened on them, but it's officials tweeting out information to um, to the residents themselves. So there's yes. a whole range of reasons why social media is so powerful in the world of geohazards. Yes, exactly. Like, as you said this morning before we were filming, uh, there's an eruption at Aso, Vol Aso Volcano in Japan. And my response was, I haven't been on Twitter yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's exactly where I go. Um, I go and I look under the hashtag, see what's happening. I uh, look at other volcanologists who I know work in the area or who I know are really good at putting out information um, during an event and the official sources, a lot of them are on social media. So it's a really powerful tool for us to build relationships and earn the respect and the trust of communities around the world so that we can give them the right information. And that ranges from someone who might be, you know, if we're talking about an eruption in Japan, someone from the UK or New Zealand, but it can also be locals or tourists who don't know where to get the right information. So it's a really powerful tool from general interest if someone is afraid of something they're seeing in the news impacting them from far away because there is a lot of tabloid junk out there that's really fear-mongering. Um, to people who are near the volcano trying to decide should I evacuate or not. Yeah, as you say, it, it encompasses fear from uh, over a whole range of scales, from from the locals to people living far away that think, is this actually going to impact me? So by having that web of, as you say, the official sources from agents, uh, government agencies, uh, volcano observatories, down to the volcanologists and the geologists that are on Twitter, putting out that information and then as you say key to have the local people on the ground because particularly with quite smaller i don't want to use the word sheltered communities but smaller communities that are reliant on local information there's a bridge of trust that always has to be dealt with very delicately so it's agencies working with say one 
um, local person that you know has the trust of that local community. I know this is something we've seen a lot in the Hawaiian Islands, for example, for eruptions over at, at Kilauea. Sometimes that flow of information from the agencies to the physical residents themselves can be bolstered and helped out by having those voices who have the trust of both sides. Yeah, yeah, and that trust is really important. And I always emphasize, you know, we have to keep earning that. We have to keep working at that. We have to make sure we are continually striving to do better. Like, social media is a relatively, well, it's a very new tool of commu um, in communication. And so, and we don't have that many volcanologists. We're a pretty small field of a couple thousand people. So there aren't that many, really, like if you look at meteorology, there are hundreds, if not thousands of them around the world there. So learning how to use these platforms effectively is so new to us. And so we're learning as we're going, striving to be better so that we can be better for the people who need it. Yeah, as you, well, most, most of our backgrounds and degrees are in physical sciences, yes. <laughs> in ge geology and geophysics and chemistry and engineering and not in public communications. But it's a responsibility that is almost, well, it's put onto as if we choose to be that voice, I guess. Part of it is we, ch we choose to do this, but there's also a bit of a moral obligation. I think many of us come into this field, not only from two sides of it. One, because we're fascinated by the natural processes and physically what's happening and the power of our planet. But the other side, it's about helping people and trying to m mitigate um, uh, risks as a result of, of hazards. Yeah, yeah, there are actually people who do research just under the communication side of it. Um, but, and we work with social sciences, which is critical because it's it's all about like how can we give the information in a way that's useful like when you have us talking to each other at conferences we're basically speaking another language and if i walked <laughs> into let's say a geochemistry conversation because that's not my specialty that might be a different language to me too we're so specialized in our field every different area that you can imagine a volcanoes has dedicated specialists to understanding that part of it so the physics of it the chemistry the math the computer modeling so having all of us having one person who can talk about all of that is is a big challenge because we are translating the scientific information you know talking to each other in the background so that we can give these complicated um bits of information in a useful way so it's 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 a growth curve <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Particularly in events where you have multiple hazards happening at once or secondary hazards as a result. So you have yeah. a volcanic eruption, but associated with that, there is seismic activity or there is maybe a, a tsunami event or local landslides and a whole range of other small secondary hazards that can happen as a result. And we have to know about these things to be able to continue the communication, but it's good to make sure we have our own network to go, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm phoning a friend. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. call it. Yeah. Um, this person can sub in for me because they are a volcano seismologist or they yeah. are a tsunami modeler. So as you say, having that, the web and the contacts outside of our own circle is so useful for, well, being able to communicate the best where we can with the public. Yeah, yeah, it, it's critical. Um, and there are a few good examples of that. Um, like when you are given, asked to go on, for example, BBC World, it's an opportunity for you to give good information. It's a really valuable opportunity for you to say what people, if you're watching and listening, what people really want to hear, what people are concerned about. But you can't phone a friend during a two minute segment, right? So you need to, um, think ahead, like, what might they ask me? So an example of that was a Krakatau uh, tsunami a few years back where there was a flank collapse, there was an associated eruption, there was volcanic lightning, and there was a tsunami that resulted in far too many fatalities. I have, you know, all of us, we learn a range of topics as we're getting our degrees, and we often give lectures on different topics, but at a very, um, I don't want to say basic level, but a very broad level. Um, and then there's the local issues, like do they have a tsunami warning system? 
So going into that, I was like, they're going to ask me about tsunamis. I'm not a tsunami expert. That's a whole technical field in itself. So I'm searching for people. I'm having calls with people who know more about tsunamis than I do, just so I can give a two-minute segment of good information. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's not just a case of jumping on camera and being ready to go. No, it's, it's a lot of preparation. A lot of preparation. Yeah. And so as well as being able to give the information, the other side of the coin, which is maybe not always as shiny, is the dealing with misinformation out there. Because, because for every volcanologist out there that's giving the right information and presenting the right sources, there's probably tenfold the number of voices out there shouting out, well, but basically the stuff that shouldn't be communicated. Yeah, it's we are so outnumbered. And it's it really... It physically hurts my heart, um, <laughs> honestly. Um, getting, you know, that, that physical feeling in your chest of heartbreak when you get a message from someone who is terrified. And I don't use that word lightly because that's a very headline word. You know, people are terrified. But I mean, when you get messages from people who are terrified, um, people who are, you know, already going through a pandemic and all of their everyday things, freaking out that this other thing is going to come and kill them, essentially or destroy their home. Um, you know, I had a message from a guy who is on dialysis every night asking me about something that was rampant on social media. And he's like, I'm here. He, his mind is going a thousand Ks an hour trying to figure out how is he going to get dialysis if he has to evacuate. So this misinformation is affecting people emotionally and mentally, and it can be dangerous. Like if yeah. you have someone running from something that isn't going to happen and they need life-saving, you know, life-sustaining medical care, that's a big deal. So that's the flip side of it is we have an opportunity to give good information, but, good information, but we are so outnumbered. And um, we also get threats from the people out there who are giving out bad information. It can be a really scary situation. Yeah, but I, one of the... the the good side of things have, in that sense is how supportive the online uh, geoscience and hazard community is. So there's always someone to help back up and say, no, you should trust this person. They are, they are trained, they are qualified for, to give this information. I can corroborate the information that they're giving you. This is from an official agency. So mm. there, is, yeah. there is that support network there as well to, to help people out, but as you say, it is it can be quite challenging yeah yeah and we have to earn that respect within our own fields too because something that i think people outside of science and it's the same with any field i'm sure uh, might not see is that you know we're constantly challenging each other that's what we do that's how science progresses we go to a conference and we're like oh but wait did you think about this oh i don't think that works because i've seen this in this other place like to get science to advance it's constantly doubting everything. You have yeah. to be a critic of your own work. You have to be your biggest critic. Um, so when it, but by the time it gets to the point of us being like, okay, this is an accepted idea. This is what we know. And saying that there's all of this that's been going on in the background for decades. So it's, you know, a quickly advancing field. It's a relatively young field too, but we also, we're managing to keep up with technology with drones and satellites, and we can even measure infrasound now, which is sound that humans can't hear, it's much lower, but that tells us information about eruptions and putting all of this technical stuff together to understand what a volcano is doing. It's an incredible process. Yeah, I, I think there was someone, when I was based out in, in Hawaii, there was someone who was working on an app for your phone that you could detect the infrasound through. So they were using networks of smartphones to gather more infrasound data, not just around about volcanic eruptions. I think it was mostly to do with them. They were using like rocket launches as, as their testing field. So for the general public who were around a rocket launch um, using the phones to detect the infrasound and th thinking about how they could then apply that to say volcanic eruptions and other um, other things like that. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, so uh, as you say, just as well as just trying to keep up with new ways of communicating information through social media, we're also having to keep up with the technology as it goes along. But I, as you say, I think we're we're managing to do that quite well. Yeah, and it's you've got to do it as a team. You know, a, yeah. 
when I um, was communicating the 2017 into 18 Agung volcanic crisis, I had a, a group of people on, on a messaging app um, in different time zones with different specialties, as well as someone in Indonesia who could look at what was happening and help me communicate what was needed to be communicated because there were also language barriers and Google Translate is awful for Indonesian. <laughs> it's a mess. Like it just it translates things that make absolute no sense. So working through that with the expertise that we had, using that as a team with one voice to communicate is something that's never seen on the surface. There's always there has to be this network of people behind someone communicating. Because you know, it's irresponsible to not be doing that. We cannot, no, no one volcanologist has knowledge across the field. In fact, to be specialized in more than one area is, is intense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, what, one of the most common questions I'm always asked is what is your favorite volcano? As, uh, with that being the assumption that you know every single one around the globe, which I don't, but maybe you're, on it. you're but yeah, maybe you're close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... uh, with with my work at the moment, I'm actually working on essentially all the volcanoes, not the Iceland ones. That's that's kind of the only area that I haven't worked on. But yeah, working on all of them, I'm updating the information um, for all of them as a team, yeah. not by myself. Um, so yeah, I, I'm working on knowing all the volcanoes, but it's that's a lot of information to keep in one brain. So I still hear about volcanoes. I'm like, which one's that? And I'll go to our website and look up and be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. And yeah. then pronouncing them is a whole different challenge. <laughs> well, you, and you're getting the opportunity to still learn every day. Absolutely. And that's, oh, I love that so much, like learning new things. I mean, like, oh, wow, I hadn't considered that before. That's incredible. It's one of the most exciting parts, I think, of being a scientist. Yes, exactly that. And um, on... On that note as well, I think one thing that I really commend you for is bringing out the lighter side of volcanoes and lava and magma. So if you if you follow Janine on Twitter, um, she will be re regularly available, I'll say, <laughs> to um, to provide you a, a regular dose of lava love and lava motivation. Many people have those like motivational cat posters in their offices of like hang on or whatever, but you will you'll take a spin of magma or lava and turn it into empowerment <laughs> yeah i think you know it's 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 a really rough time for a lot of people around the world a lot of people with the pandemic have lost someone um a lot of people have lost jobs have lost income so if we can give a little bit of light as people are strolling scrolling through the twitter timeline you know i think that's important it's important to give people a break from the doom scrolling i know i need it if yeah. i'm scrolling through um which i actually didn't do for a long time i didn't scroll through twitter i would go there to find things but i just couldn't couldn't face the the dark space that twitter was turning into so yeah yeah <laughs> Thank you. <Yep. laughs> Hanging kittens no, no. on trees, but using photos of, of photos of volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it it works, and I think it brings a smile to many people. And as you say, it brings that balance between what we're doing in terms of learning about these incredible, amazing natural processes, but at the same time, having that humbled, uh, well, perspective of uh, of the hazards and the risks themselves. Um, mm. Because one thing that always jump, jumps out to me on Twitter, and I'm sure you'll you'll say the same thing, is that volcanologists can't keep quiet if something's happening. Like, we we will be on it immediately. And one thing we get accused of is, is the hiding of information from people. <laughs> it's yeah. like, there there is no way that, say, something would happen somewhere and it wouldn't be being spoken about by the majority of volcanologists or geologists on Twitter. Yeah, and it's it's not even that. Like, it, okay, so if you don't trust science, which I understand a lot of people don't, some for, you know, personal reasons, others because it's it's... It's foreign, right? And to, um, to to trust something we're not aware of. It's not because people are stupid. It's it's something so different. And everyone's living their own lives with their own challenges. So keeping that in mind is really important going through this. But um, I completely forgot what you said and what I was talking about. Can you? 
<laughs> Absolutely no problem. Um, um, no, just that we 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 can never keep quiet if something's <laughs> happening in the world of, of geoscience. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. It's it's not just us. So a yeah. lot of a lot of data is publicly available. Maybe not like the nitty gritty because that would take enormous servers to put up just something like a broadband seismic station or, or network plus you know thermal infrared plus infrasound but um there a lot of observatories do have seismic stations webcams um these things up on their website um and there are also outside of the observatory there are global seismic networks and things like that plus there are satellites plus there are people often living by the volcanoes and feeling the earthquakes so it's even though you know essentially we're a at heart a bunch of nerds who love volcanoes and love talking about volcanoes and love sharing things about volcanoes but it's you know even if we wanted to which is a ridiculous concept in itself you can't hide a volcano and if it's no. erupting <laughs> you sure as heck can't hide that <laughs> no but uh, as you say we, we we get that there's an excitement between, because we, we learn about these things for so many years and then you, you're able to see it play out as well. But then there's that, obviously that moral duty and obligation to be able to make sure we communicate the side of things that people need to know at the same time. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so one of the other things um, that you do, well, you, you've got plenty of other things that you've done. So I'd, I'd, um, I'd recommend people to, to have a look through um, your your website so they can find the links to everything, but just highlighting a couple. Um, you have a, a YouTube um, series of mini videos that you did um, throughout the, from the beginning of lockdown last year called Volcano Moments. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about that, what your, um, well, what, what your inspiration was to do that and uh, how, you, how you found it's all gone. Yeah, um, so I think everyone, or most people can relate to the sense of helplessness that we had during the beginning of the pandemic. Like, um, my natural response to most things is how can I help? Like I want to help, I want to do something useful. But clearly, like I'm not an epidemiologist. There was nothing I could actually do other than staying at home um, and you know, being res responsible for myself. There was nothing else I could do. So of course I kept digging with that and it just clicked one day like I can give people, especially those who are homeschooling, um, those who are looking for something that's outside of the pandemic for a little bit of a break, something to watch, just something that's short, something with subtitles so that people can look at it on their phones. So I wanted to bring um, experts from around the world in as like guests on this to give them a, a chance to share their research about what excites them. So, you know, having chats with people before you, you you know this because you did one yep. with me. Thank you. Um, is like what excites you, what is important to you? What do you want people to know? And then giving it in a way that, um, that everyone can use and have fun with. So I wanted to give something that people who are homeschooling could use people who just needed a break, just giving something, and it's, it's been really good. Um, I did experience really, really severe burnout. So a lot of that stuff has been put on the back burner for about it, over a year now. <laughs> but I'm doing much better now. So um, I'm really starting to think of starting that back up again because it's, it's a fun platform where you can just give people a chance to talk about what matters to them. Plus the other thing that um, motivates me is that YouTube is really bad at having good information on volcanoes. Really horrific. A lot of really pretty videos, but if you're looking for information on volcanoes, there's not much there. It, it, will, it will jump straight to um, c conspiracy videos, and this is the the, the doomsday the, the doomsday video that has several million views that everybody clicks on. Yeah. So being able to direct people to little bite-sized um, videos like this is something really, really great. And there's, you've got dozens, d dozens of. I think I'm only just realising how many of these <laughs> you did over the over the course of just a few months. Um, but there's a whole range of um, lengths and sizes, and the range of diversity of people you were able to bring on was absolutely brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, I actually took weeks off my job. I don't. I don't have paid leave. Uh, I'm a contractor. <laughs> um, I took weeks off work so I could get out as much as I could quickly, so that it was a resource people could use. And then I slowed down and 
yeah. produce them more slowly. But yeah, that was a learning curve. I tell you, yes. doing captions is not not my most fun thing to do because first of all, <laughs> I have to listen to myself and see my face, which I think most of us can agree is not fun. Um, but it, yeah, with a New Zealand accent, although I know I'm sounding a little more American now, um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> something that we're we're still we're a bit more well versed on now, but still getting used to. Every, there's always another another platform or another way of doing video servicing or recording something that we get used to. Yes. And so just finally, the the other thing you have is you also have a Volcano podcast, uh, which I, I feel I should definitely mention and recommend to people. So that is uh, Popular Volcanics that you host uh, with uh, Dr. Eric Clemetti. Um, so what was the motivation behind this? Because you, you started this about two years ago? Oh, goodness. I don't know. That? I mean, what is time anymore? Yeah. <laughs> it was totally... Eric's idea. I'd thought about doing podcasts every now and again, um, and I was like, I don't, I don't even know where to start. Um, so Eric, I was on a call with him about something else, I think, and he's like, what do you think about doing a podcast? And I thought he meant him. And I was like, yeah, there's, we don't have one. That would be an awesome idea. Someone should do it. And he's like, okay, let's do it. And I was like, sure, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, all Eric's idea. He does the hard work. He does all the editing and everything. Um, we... Um, because of COVID and everything, we had to stop. But uh, we did do more of an educational series that people could use instead of, you know, you know, with the home learning. And that was the last thing we did. But um, I really want to get started up again when we're both in the space where we can and get uh, more diversity in guests and, and speak more about volcanoes in that way. Because, you know, there are so many different ways to get information. Yeah. Um, like I've just seen a seismologist, Wendy Bohan, has joined uh, TikTok, which is awesome. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, and... I feel like the, the TikTok transition needs to happen for us at some point, but I can't, I can't Oof. bring myself to do it just yet. <laughs> no. But her videos have been fantastic so far. Yeah, earthquake yoga. Yes. <laughs> that really, that just lit up my whole day. So you go do earthquake yoga. So yeah, check that out, Wendy Bohan. Yep. She is fantastic. There we go. All right, so we're getting close to time. So the last thing I want to ask you is, what is your most memorable volcano-related experience? That would definitely have to be the Argung eruption um, in late 2017. So I'd finished my PhD and 100% of my time was dedicated to finding a job because um, being a foreigner, I had to have a job within a certain amount of time to be able to stay in the United States. And mm -hmm. I couldn't afford to move home. I'd been a student for five years. Um, I had my two cats that I was not gonna leave behind. So there was a real pressure on you know finding a job. And anyone who is in a small field knows there aren't many jobs ever. So <laughs> that was what my focus was. And a friend of mine that I went to school with was in Bali and said, um, what the heck is going on? People are telling me the whole oh, island is going to erupt, essentially. And so I looked into it, and I'd noticed the alert level had been raised for Argung. I'd been to Bali a few years before just as a tourist, so I had a little idea of the, um, the tourism situation there, which a lot of people depend on for income. And I realized that looking at headlines, there was no good information out there, nothing. Like what I was reading in the official reports, which I was then translating and in my mind retranslating into something that made sense, there was nothing. Um, there was no similarities between them. So I was like, okay, why, why isn't anyone doing anything? Because I mean, the Indonesians were so busy. This was a, a huge event with a big population. They didn't have the resources to put this into English. And I'm looking around, you know, just finishing my PhD, um, not really being anyone. Um, I'm not saying if you just finish your PhD, you're no one. That's just how I felt personally. <laughs> um, and I was like, why isn't anyone doing anything? And I only had, I don't know, seven, no, a few thousand followers at that time on Twitter. But I just started putting out the information in English. And I had no idea how that was going to change my whole life. I ended up dedicating, um, I stopped searching for a job. I was terrified I was putting my entire career at risk because volcanologists at that point, you know, the information has to come from the observatory and not much else. We yep. know better now. We know that if more of us talk um, and amplify that information, that's actually really important. 
but it was really scary and it ended up being three months of uh, working through the night. I was a 12 hour time difference away. I was in Pittsburgh at the time just putting out information um, and listening to what people weren't understanding and working with a team in the background and getting what sleep I could through the day. So that's what really showed me the power of communication in my own life and what you can do. Um, you know, the messages from people who were afraid and who I could help understand what the official information was really changed my life. And nothing's gone back to pre argon That was yeah. a huge, huge <laughs> event. Well, well, thank you for, for sharing that with us. So as a, as a wrap up, we just want to thank Janine um, uh, for being for being with us today. All of the things that we've talked about and uh, the links uh, to, um, to Twitter, to Volcano Moments on YouTube, uh, the Popular Volcanic series, uh, we'll be including all of those within the descriptions, whether you're watching this on YouTube or um, th listening as a podcast or another medium, we'll have all of those links available so you can check out all the stuff we've been talking about. So uh, I know we could probably keep talking for several more episodes, but I'm going to let you go and have your uh, your breakfast, I imagine. Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so um, once again, thank you, Janine, for being with us today. Thank you. It's my honour.